So welcome everybody um, to this, uh, it's a taster lecture. So um, an example of the kinds of uh, teaching and discussions that go on at uh, IRDR at UCL. And uh, this one is coming from the Center for Gender and Disaster. Um, so I'm going to um, share my screen now. So fingers crossed that there isn't a major disaster at that point. Uh, here we go. And now you should have the screen. And um, I thought what I would do today uh, is think about feminist theory and feminist approaches and uh, how they might make a difference to disaster case studies. So it's, it's very much about um, the, the methods. Um, so it's more about how than the what. Um, I'm Maureen Fordham. Um, I'm one of the directors of the Center for Gender and Disaster at IRDR at UCL. Uh, I also coordinate the Gender and Disaster Network. So uh, we, we do a lot of gender, um, but we, we do it in a way that is very broad, um, very open. Um, uh, we'll have an opportunity to discuss some of those things. So um, what I wanted to share with you was uh, um, a piece of research that was done uh, with other colleagues in IRDR and other colleagues in Nepal. Uh, it's called Mantra, and I'll explain what that means later. And so I'll use that as a case study, as an example of a, an approach, let's call it an approach to doing research. So we're thinking about methods and um, exploring what we mean by feminist theory and method. And um, <laughs> this is a short lecture and I'm not going to try and turn everybody into um, feminist researchers in the short space of time I've got. But I, what I want to do is just, just to kind of present an, a, a way of thinking that borrows from feminist theory and method. So we'll look at a particular part of the mantra project. Uh, and this is the, the very qualitative piece. And it's specifically the photo voice element. And I'll explain about that as well as we go along. And then the question really is, and it's a question for you, uh, which I, I hope you'll um, uh, respond to in the chat and in, a, in the discussion later about well, what, what does that kind of approach give us that others don't? Um, and vice versa, maybe. So um, the lecture is being recorded, but um, my colleague here, Alex, Alex Middleton, she uh, is going to switch off the recording when the, the main lecture part has finished. And then there'll be an opportunity to ask questions or make comments. Um, and if you have questions about uh, the course itself, uh, those are questions that I, I can only answer a tiny amount of, but uh, Alex can answer a bit more and she'll answer them particularly from a student's perspective. So you get to know what it's like to be a student at um, IRDR. And uh, you're welcome. Um, in fact, you know, I, I, I'd love you to add comments, add questions uh, in the chat box during the lecture, and we'll try and sort them out and respond to them uh, at the end. So, um, mantra. And for any good research project, you have to have an acronym, and this is our acronym, uh, Maternal and Newborn Technology for Resilience in Rural Areas. And, um, this, as you can see, is a, uh, a collaboration uh, with uh, UCL, of course, um, with ODI, uh, Overseas Development Institute, Media for Development, who uh, did the film work, Herd International, who are um, fantastic uh, health researchers in Nepal, 
and Hearn Geoserve, um, who uh, contributed to our understanding of the environmental risks. Our um, cameraman in Nepal was Dinesh Diakota, and um, so he he's the real author of the photo voice stories that you'll see. So first a question, and you can maybe add some um, responses in the chat or, or think of a question or a comment for later. But if you were going to um, study the, the impacts of the 2015 earthquake in Nepal on pregnant and newly delivered women, you know, what, what kind of research methods would you use and, and why would you be selecting those? Um, and we can come back to that afterwards. And of course, it depends very much on at what point you begin and what your, your research question is. So trying to understand the impact on um, that group or those groups, that's the kind of first level of, of research question. And then there's some others below, gonna happen below that. So that's the point at which you're gonna be thinking about, well, what's the best way to find an answer to a question like that? So Mantra, it wasn't designed as a feminist project, but it does have elements, and the photo voice is particularly an element that reflect feminist principles. Uh, and, and of course, there were several, several feminists, uh, declared feminists, who were uh, involved in the project itself. So that's going to be our focus for today and um, give you a, an, an overview introduction to the project and some of, um, some of our findings. So with, with the help of our, our partners at HERD International, um, the Kavre district was selected because it was one of the most uh, hardest hit uh, districts with that earthquake. And I'm not going to go into um, a discussion of the earthquake itself. Uh, you can find that uh, material elsewhere. This is um, a, a different focus today. Uh, it was funded through um, NERC, the Natural Environment Research Council, as part of the Global Challenges Research Fund. And um, it was very much a collaborative interdisciplinary project. And we, we actually covered a lot in just a year, well, actually even under a year, uh, a, a mobile app was de developed and that was led by uh, our colleague, Patty Koskova um, in IRDR, um, who leads another research center. Um, we used a serious game methodology because uh, we were working with um, uh, a a population with uh, very low uh, educational attainment. So um, some of our, yeah, a lot, actually quite a lot of people couldn't read. Um, and so we tried to develop something that was gonna be useful, but it didn't have any text in it, didn't have any words in it. That was a real challenge. So uh, a serious game methodology was the choice. And I mean, that's an interesting topic in its own right, but that's the subject, of, that would be a subject of another lecture. So we did a lot of uh, qualitative interviews, focus group discussions, and the photo, uh, photo voice project. So in the end, I suppose we, we had a, around, well, over a hundred people. Uh, I mean, we, we can add a few numbers here and there, but, um, the photo voice participants were nine, um, and it's oh, we only have time to look at a, a couple of those, but um, I can provide some links for those who are interested uh, to some of the others. So we were talking with um, female community health volunteers, pregnant women, women who um, had, had delivered during the earthquake, um, people who were in, in support of the women, 
um, health workers, community leaders, etc. But what the photo voice uh, participants do is give you real insight into how it felt to be living through uh, that disaster. So for example, one of the major things we found out was <clears throat> that there was a real lack of knowledge from people. They just didn't know what could be done. And um, people said things like, I wanted to ask, you know, how, how to stay, where to go. If the earthquake occurred again, we will die. So what to do, where to go? People really struggling with these questions, even though they had been given information. But um, look what happens sometimes with the information that we, the experts, provide. We used to read in book and hear, heard elderly and knowledgeable people saying, stay under the bed, under the door when the earthquake occurs. While staying like that, several people died and there was a huge accident. My own brother's daughter was playing outside. Immediately after hearing that, she went insta inside to hide and was injured while going there. I've, I've heard that that has occurred in other disasters as well. Uh, the women themselves who were uh, pregnant or, and give, or giving birth, uh, one pregnant woman said, I went to fetch water. It was a massive earthquake occurred. We were three or four friends there and ran away when, uh, when earthquake occurred. I couldn't run and couldn't even reach a little further at all during, during that pregnancy stage, whereas <clears throat> other people ran and reached far away. So when we, when we think about um, telling people to uh, evacuate, uh, to move to higher ground, to safer ground, whatever it might be, we're often not, not thinking about people who cannot easily um, move for whatever reason. Uh, the hospital was also damaged. All the glass had fallen on the ground. All the delivery was conducted on the floor and this and, and she showed a mat. The mat was used on the floor and all the postnatal women were made to sleep on there. Um, these were the kinds of conditions that, that women were uh, having to give birth in. We did find, um, you know, we are asked about, well, what, what services did people get? And um, they, they had a lot of difficulty in getting emergency transport or if they did get it, it was very expensive. Um, the birthing centers themselves were seriously damaged. Uh, maternity hospital in Kathmandu, um, very cramped, very overstretched in terms of resources. And there were high private hospital costs um, and uh, there's a lot of other material related to that actually, um, because those are just the direct costs of uh, being in hospital, but there are other indirect costs in terms of um, the impacts on the rest of the family who have to support the perfect person in hospital. And um, yes, aid did come, some aid did come, but it was late in coming. So all of those findings were, were very interesting, very useful, but um, there are a number of projects, I think, that, that, that got similar findings. So um, I wonder what difference it would make then if we approached it by exploring feminist theory and feminist method. And there's a, a lot of, I'll say right at the start, there's a lot of focus in uh, this lecture on women uh, and that's because of our primary focus on, uh, on uh, women giving birth but when we talk about gender when we talk about feminist theory and method we are when I say we I mean me <laughs> I'm not just talking about women um, but quite often um, women 
is the largest category um, uh, who are being disadvantaged that we have to address, but it's not an exclusive category. So I wonder then, um, you know, I've said the F word feminist. Um, what do you understand by that term? And, and, and what do you think feminist methods or approaches might be um, or should be or could be? Uh, so, you know, as we go through, you know, you're welcome to put chat um, remarks and um, I'm hoping to try and get through uh, some of them later. So, first of all, I would say um, it's contested, it's fluid, you know, that you cannot really come up with this is the definition. Um, there, there's no simple answer to what feminist theory and feminism is and is about. Um, but um, this, I think, is an interesting way to approach it uh, from Carol McCann et al. In, Femin in the feminist theory reader, for all its ambiguity and limitations, you know, it's recognized, feminist, feminism signals an emancipatory politics on behalf of women. It contends that the prevailing conditions under which women live are unjust and must be changed. Moreover, it assumes that groups of historical agents, in this case, women, will act to change them. So it gives, it's not just about assuming vulnerability and um, subordination. It's also about seeing the historical agents as agents, you know, having agency and ability to act. So we're talking about um, emancipatory pro um, processes here and there, there are emancipatory research methods as well that you, you could consider. Uh, put a box there, giving people social or political freedom and rights, just one way of thinking about it. So the, the same from the same source, I've just slightly adapted these, um, just to give some idea about, if you were approaching a research project, what kinds of questions would you be asking? And you could adapt some of these questions and apply them to a project that in, that's in your area. I've highlighted um, some bits in red because I, I thought I would just um, refer to those a bit more in, in the next slide or so. So thinking about structures of gender difference and how they subordinate women. Uh, how is women's subordination shaped by interconnected systems of oppression? So interconnections uh, based on race, ethnicity, nationality, class, sexuality, ability, gender identity. You know, we're not just talking about sex or gender categories. We're talking about a whole um, interconnected system here. But you can ask these kinds of questions and um, you can see how that, where that leads you to in terms of how you might, what method you might use to approach answering them. So um, if you think about those questions and how they may translate into method, how do structures of gender difference subordinate women? And we're talking here, this is, a, this is one of the typical words that um, associated with research methodology, ontology, you know, in, in terms of ontology, we're talking about what, what is reality? How do we understand reality? And how can we understand existence? And so we're starting from a feminist perspective, we're starting from a feminist ontology, which already um, views the world in this um, uh, unequal way, this huge power, um, imbalance. And then thinking about um, all of those interconnected systems, that takes us into uh, looking at feminist and intersectional theories. So I think uh, more and more now, in considering gender, people are opening that up and 
although uh, the, the book that I'm quoting from and the particular study I'm looking at is very much focused on women, that is just one part of uh, the whole when we're looking at uh, feminist uh, theory and approaches. Because actually, although it started very much in this binary way, male and female, um, men and women, masculine and feminine, it's, it's opened up so much more in the last um, decade, decade or two. And even in the last decade, I think, there have been big changes. So um, it's much bigger than just, just looking at women because you've got to look at the relations between the genders to understand what's going on. Um, if we were to look at uh, how can we be sure that we've clear understandings of oppressive situations, if we're, if we're starting from a feminist perspective, we're assuming that women as a group are being oppressed at, um, through these kinds of um, social structures. And so that takes us into uh, epistemology, the theory of, of knowledge uh, with regard to the, to the methods that we might use. So that takes us then into the feminist methods, um, feminist epistemology, rather than feminist ontology, the understanding of how the world uh, works. So if we think about feminist methods, uh, I think a lot of people automatically think of qualitative more than quantitative and might think about why that may, might be the case. And we look a bit, a bit more about that at, um, later. But if you look at Shulamit uh, Reinhardt's work from 1992, you know, it's quite old now, but it was one of the early um, texts that, that really uh, uh, broadened our understanding of feminist methods in social research. And number one is that feminism is a perspective, not a research method. And I think um, this is important because it, it makes it, it opens up this, this whole box. It gives um, so many more possibilities. If you think of feminism as a perspective, as uh, a way of thinking, a way of being for many people, and not just thinking, thinking about it in this instrumentalist way as just another research method. So uh, Reinhardt is arguing that feminists actually use all sorts of research methods, um, but inherent really in the, in the whole approach is this ongoing critique of non-feminist uh, scholarship. Um, and the important aspect for uh, many feminists and feminist researchers is is this aspect of trying to create change. So it's not doing research for, for the sake of doing research. It's doing research with the idea of creating or enabling an environment for social change. So that's uh, an important element uh, that comes into qualitative and particularly feminist methods which would be, which would have a major um, critique from those who are working in a more positivist or neo-positivist um, classical um, natural science methods framework, because they would argue that that is already introducing massive amount of bias and a lack of objectivity. And that's another conversation we could have. So I think one of the first steps in uh, a, a feminist approach is to hear from a, the marginalized group, uh, the oppressed group, um, from them themselves. So structured social surveys don't really offer the same uh, opportunities for, um, and, and 
you know, what is what is the word we use to describe the people uh, we we are researching, uh, on whom we are carrying out research, or is it that the people that we are doing research with? Um, so is it a participant or a responder or a, a subject or even an object of research? Uh, it, it starts to open up questions about the relationship between the researcher and the researched and, and the power structure um, inherent in that. So we don't have time to go through um, all of that, but it you know it's something that that we we would uh, we would discuss uh, in in the courses um, at ILDR. So um, let's have a look at uh, the photo voice um, case study. So uh, photo voice, it's uh, it's a it's a particular kind of approach to not just research, but you know, advocacy and giving voice to those who often um, don't have a voice. And um, there is a, you know, an official photo voice um, organization, if you like. And uh, they are promoting the ethical use of photography for po positive social change, through delivering innovative participatory pho photography projects. That's, that's how they frame it, but quite often photo voice has been now, now been kind of taken as a more generic term and people adapt it and use it um, slightly differently. Um, originally, it's, it's very much about giving a camera to the people themselves. So they tell their own story through their own pictures um, through their own camera. Ours was a kind of pilot study. We didn't have the time to do everything um, uh, at this stage. We were just exploring. <clears throat> so we did a version of this and um, you can follow up the kinds of work that Dinesh um, Dakota um, has done elsewhere. He's a fantastic filmmaker. So, uh, actually, I've said three examples, but I decided to take one of them out because uh, we don't have a lot of time and I'm going to stop talking soon and uh, give, give you the opportunity to talk and ask questions. But in, in hearing these couple of stories, you know, what, what, do, what do they say to you, really? Um, and particularly thinking about the, the, the method that's been used and what what you get out of hearing these stories. So um, here is Ambika's story, and this is what she says. Uh, all these, all the people in the, 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 the films and the photo voice stories were asked to select an object, um, an object, a location, that was important, was meaningful to them in, uh, in the context of the earthquake. This is what she says. This boulder lies in front of my house. I can see it from my front door, morning, noon and night. It always frightens me. Three big rocks rolled down from above. I just stood and watched them coming down to see where they would end up. The sound that I heard at that time was like that of a river, a big river. Everyone was screaming that I should run away from there. But I was so stunned and frightened that I could only see blue, green and yellow in my mind. I get anxious and scared every time I see this rock. I tremble in my mind. It, is it always going to be like this? I wish I didn't have to live here anymore. I wish I could live someplace else. I'm very fearful when it rains heavily. Maybe more rocks will fall. This rock keeps reminding me of the earthquake. It consumes my mind. This is um, a, a, a typical response um, I've found over the years, people in disasters, um, that, that places and things uh, and people uh, to some extent become the focus of the, uh, the disaster itself. And you can see that she has constant reminders. Um, it's, 
it's a boulder in front of her house and it says so much more than a boulder and if you were there you would just walk by this uh, it would be meaningless to you but for her it's got enormous significance uh, Bimala, um, this banana tree lies close to my house. I see it whenever I pass this way and it sometimes reminds me of that night. We spent the entire night under this tree and survived. This was during a time when we thought that we were going to die. The earthquake kept happening again and again. Along with the nine members of my family, there are about 30, 35 other people under that tree. The leaves of the tree gave us shelter from the rain. We had nothing to sit on. Our 80 year old grandfather spent the night on our laps. There were little children with us. I felt the banana tree somehow saved us. It gave us shelter, gave us shelter. We spent the night there, but I've not yet eaten a fruit from the tree. This is just a, a tiny story, but it's so full of meaning and significance for uh, the person who tells you the story. Uh, but you passing by, you'll just see a banana tree. I think it's interesting that she says at the end, I've not eaten a fruit from the tree. And you know what, one would like to continue that conversation with her. So for me, um, what do they convey? They definitely convey the importance of letting the women and others um, speak for themselves. Hearing firsthand accounts from people's own standpoint, from their lived experience, it's, it's, it conveys so much that um, often research reports can't do. It's very much about focusing on the meaning of this earthquake in uh, people's lives not just on the numbers. Now that's not to discount numbers and the value of having numbers, um, but numbers will not give you everything. And sometimes you have a number, but you really do not know what that means. And I don't think it, there are many ways to get the kind of uh, richness of experience as those little photo voice stories have, have conveyed, uh, how would you do that through other methods? And there are other methods, but uh, I think it's a, um, a, very, um, a, a very valuable method to explore. And it, it has all of the elements of, uh, of a feminist approach because it's, it's giving the direction to the women themselves to, uh, to, to talk about what they want to talk about. So um, in a minute, Alex will stop recording. I'll just flick through the next few slides. So, uh, and, and then we will return to this one in particular to open up the discussion. So going back to those questions I asked about the, the research methods and, and you know, the way you might approach um, just studying that topic and how you are thinking about feminist and what you think uh, method, those feminist methods and approaches might be. I, I haven't had time to talk about very much of them at the moment. Um, so there's more that could be said um, and about the images and the stories themselves. Um, and there's a, there's a link uh, further on. Uh, I'll try and get the links to you, anyone who's interested. And there's, there's an example on YouTube, for example, where you can hear someone actually speaking. So what does that approach give us that others don't? So um, that's the end of the lecture bit. Um, there's, there's some slides here with some further reading, uh, particularly about um, the, the methods we used in the, in the mantra project uh, about the earthquake, etc. cetera. Um, a few more that are more about um, uh, feminist theory, feminist methods. Again, it's a vast field, but you know, just a few um, that you might look at. 
and then the other stories which we don't have time for um that you can see these others and the kinds of images that they're looking at the upstairs room that um they used to sleep in um that was very risky um the the, the bus um uh that that um had a serious issue uh when the earthquake hit and um, disturbed the ground to a great extent. Um, this woman, Kalpana, she took a photograph of her grandmother on a mobile phone uh, and it just gives her flashbacks all the time. Uh, landslides and the conditions that people were living in and the, uh, the, the tent that um, particularly uh, pregnant or newly delivered women were, uh, were allowed to use and what that meant to them. And um, the, the, the rocks and the rock fall, and there were several stories uh, of, about people being hit by falling rocks and even killed by them. Uh, somebody's sweater, uh, and this just symbolizes so much. Um, I've worn this sweater two or three times after the earthquake. I'll keep it as I don't know who to give it to. It's here with me, not that I really want it, because it's reminding her every day of the fear that she went through. And the condition of uh, the houses that people are still living in, and um, sometimes cats or rats drop mud from the walls. Uh, you know, the, the, there's a richness of explanation in people's own voices that you don't normally get. And this is Apsara's story of her and her daughter that you can uh, follow up uh, on YouTube. Okay, so uh, thank, thank